when I was a little boy growing up, South Arkansas, and that's one of the reasons I didn't learn to speak French very well, <laughs> I could cut loose with a great deal of redneck, but I'm not sure it would be understood in New York. But as a little boy growing up in South Arkansas, my mother did what a lot of other mothers did, and perhaps it's true of your own mother. If I fell and scraped my knee or my elbow, and we didn't readily have medicine available to apply, my mother did what a lot of mothers did when there was not a adequate medicine available. She would say, let me kiss it and I'll make it better. Did your mother ever do that? Maybe your mother had medicine, I don't know. But that was a phrase that I grew up thinking that really was going to be medicinally valuable because a mother's kiss would just make it better. Now, did it actually bring healing? Well, in a way, I guess it did. My feelings were better anyway to know that I was loved. But I want to say that when I heard the president's speech yesterday, I thought that here was a man who had no medicine. Here was a man who only had yet another speech. And his speech, like so many lately, are filled with words that almost make it appear that he believes that if he applies his speech to the ills of humanity, that somehow his speech will make it all better. Mr. Obama. You cannot speech your way into resolving the deep conflicts of the Middle East and the world. And there is no level of diplomacy that your speechifying is going to be able to so rise that it will resolve these deep conflicts. I'm not sure I understand or ever have understood why the support has been so strong particularly from many of my Jewish friends toward President Obama in his last election. We used to also say, fool me once, shame on me, or shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I have to believe that even in the Ninth District of New York, the election results last week were a clear indication and the remarkable courage of former Mayor Ed Koch to endorse a Republican in that race were an indication and a message being sent that the money and the votes are no longer going to be taken for granted in the Jewish community because people are aware that this is a president who clearly has no concept of exactly what is at stake in the constant world of strife that goes on in the Middle East. I want to tell you today, I love Israel. I love Israel and I've loved it since I first visited it in 1973. I, I went there and I didn't know what to expect. But I felt as if I was in a country very much like my own. It mirrored in so many ways that sense of, of a frontier of freedom where people knew that they had come there to escape the galloping terror of tyranny. And they came with a sense because they knew that if they did not find refuge in their own land and make it safe and secure, that their children and the children after their children would have no hope of peace or even existence. Israel does not fight for mere prosperity. Israel does not stand so that it can simply have more money than the next gen or the generation before it. It stands and it must fight for its very existence because there are forces in this world that would love not to make it smaller, but to make it go away. And that's why the irrational idea that if Israel would continue to give up increasing amounts of the tiny bit of real estate that it currently has, that somehow it would magically produce peace is as absurd and as irrational as somehow thinking that a Barack Obama speech is going to bring peace to the Middle East and end all the conflicts that have been going on, not for 30 years, but for 3,000. That is absurd. I've made 
numerous trips, close to 20 trips now to Israel since 1973. I just returned in July. I'll be taking a group of about 200 Americans in February. One of my great joys now is to take people who've never been. And, and I learn something myself every time, but quite frankly, the joy I have is looking at Israel through the eyes of those who have never been and seeing the tears come down their faces as they put their feet in places that they've read about but now for the first time they stand on truly holy ground. I recognize Israel is a nation that like all nations, including ours, has its faults. But the difference is that Israel allows the world and its own people to see the warts and even vote on them. I was there in July, there were some protesting, protests just getting underway about uh, dissatisfaction with availability of housing. And I thought I was back in America. Here were people protesting. But do you know the same signal difference between what I saw there and what one would see uh, in the land of a butcherous uh, Syria or in the land of uh, Mahmoud Ahmed Nutjob from Iran? <laughs> the difference is the Israeli government did not shoot the people who were protesting, but they allowed them to exercise their voices. And this is the remarkable thing that we must say to the rest of the world. Israel, perfect? No nation is. But it is a nation that allows its people to protest even their own government, which is the key and the framework for real freedom and for democracy. I cannot bring myself to call Ahmadinejad his name without wanting to call him Ahmad Nutjob because honestly, I don't know of anyone who has earned that title so clearly than he has. And I could not help but think what an absolute absurdity to allow that man to walk into a building not far from where we sit today and to give him a forum and allow him to spew the venomous hatred, the venomous vile that he was able to do and to get worldwide attention for it. He should have been laughed out of that assembly rather than tolerated. Thank God there were some people who were willing to get up and walk out. I wish everyone had gotten up and walked out, and the person controlling the microphone would have simply turned it off to spare all of us from the outrage and the horrors. The showdown that is scheduled for tomorrow, if in fact it does happen, should never happen. And the U.S. should do far more than threaten a veto even though the threat of the veto has been awfully tepid with our ambassador giving mixed signals as to whether or not we would with the statement of we will wait and see. There's nothing to wait for. There's nothing to see. What we're waiting for is the hatred of a people toward Israel by teaching their children that all Israelis and all Jews should die. What is else to see and to be offended by and appalled by. I think that we should have made it clear, not merely that we would veto any attempt to bring that vote to the United Nations, but that furthermore, that the very attempt to bring the vote would mean immediate cessation of all funding for every aspect of the UN activities including any support for it remaining in the United States. I think we should have ordered jackhammers right there on the grounds, floated into the East River, and ask any nation that would like to host it to be our guest. We will help in the towing of the entire facility to any nation that would like to have such a forum that would allow that sort of hatred in its midst. Frankly, we pressured the wrong side. As a nation, our policies over these past couple of years has been put more pressure on Israel for building communities and essentially building bedrooms in Judea and Samaria than we have put pressure on the Iranians to stop building a nuclear bomb that is pointed at Israel and at ourselves. This is absurd. And the response of our president has largely been to quote from uh, an individual from some time ago, can't we all just get along? Well, frankly, 
not as long as the textbooks that are passed out to children in the Palestinian schools teach hate, it's hard to get along. It's hard to get along when Katusha rockets are fired from Gaza into communities like Starro, where I've been and stood behind a police station where thousands, over 4,000 Katusha rockets are, are lined up and cataloged there for anyone who is willing to open his or her eyes to see and recognize that these are rockets that were fired into the roofs of synagogues and homes and shops and into parks indiscriminately, intending to maim and to kill people Innocent children and people who are simply going to work are living in their community because a few hundred yards away from Stero, it was possible for those rockets to be launched from Gaza by an organization, Hamas, that is maybe the glove, but the hand inside that glove is Iran. And we all know that. And, and when people have, have, have said to me after I come back from Israel and I take a rather unabashed position when it comes to what the U.S. role should be in all of this. And, and maybe I'm a minority, maybe I'm a lonely voice crying in the wilderness, but I really don't care because when they say, but don't you think the Israelis ought to give more? I ask them this, and this is only metaphorical, Minister, but if the Canadians decided to start firing rockets across the border into Buffalo or Detroit, May I ask you, how many rockets fired would it take before Americans would say, that's enough? How many? 4,000? 3,000? 2,000? I think the auction has just ended because I heard someone say one. And my dear friends, I assure you that it wouldn't take 4,000 rockets before every American, whether they live near the border or not, would be crying out and demanding response and retaliation one rocket would be all it took. And we have asked of the Israelis to take not one, not two, but thousands and thousands of those rockets and somehow sit back and not complain that more are on their way. We cannot ask of other nations what we as a nation would be unwilling to tolerate under any circumstances whatsoever. I've appreciated the fact that when I've been in Israel, it is holy ground to Jews, to Christians, and to Muslims. And one of the things I've always noted is that the Israeli government protects the rights of all who wish to go and to worship. I've never been told that I could not worship even though I'm an evangelical Christian believer. I have watched the Israeli soldiers patrol on the Temple Mount and protect the rights of those who follow Islam to go to the mosque and to the Dome of the Rock and to adamantly protect, sometimes uh, even with great anxiety on the part of Israelis uh, who, who don't understand why their government would do it, but I'll tell you, it is one of the great points of light in this world to see the Israeli soldiers willing to protect a shrine that does not mean to them what it means to those who go and worship, but they respect that it is in fact a holy place for someone and they allow it, they do more than tolerate it, they protect it. Let me ask you, do you think I could lead the building of a church in Riyadh? I wonder if I ask, could I start a congregation in Damascus if I would be granted permission? Would the government of Syria be as good to protect me in that endeavor? I think not. I know not. If I were to attempt to do it, one thing about it, my critics would not have to worry about me anymore. I would never be seen or heard from ever, ever again. No, when people are asking, why doesn't Israel just get along better? Well, part of it is because they see what happens when the savage, brutal slaughter of a family sleeping in their beds like the Fogel family is met with dancing and celebration and realizing that no matter what religion a person may be, that should be disgusting and appalling and not something to be cheered, but an act to be wept over. 
I've watched when people are sick, are injured, and it did not matter whether they were Jewish or Christian or Muslim, they were given the same level of treatment in the Israeli hospitals without regard. If that is racism, then the world needs more of it, not less of it. It is not racism. It is humanitarianism. I hear the cries that Jerusalem should be carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey with parts of it given to various ideolo ideological groups and, and people who have their own agenda. But I would suggest to you that one of the reasons that Jerusalem must remain an undivided and complete city of whole is because it is a place that needs to be a free place, not a place where people are forbidden, but a place where people are welcome. I have every confidence that under Israeli rule, Jerusalem will be a city as it was intended to be, a city where people can peacefully go and worship whatever their faith may happen to be. When I hear people say we should have all of the community building, that people like to call it, who are its critics, settlements. I like to think of it as communities in Judea and Samaria, but the semantics are less important, as is the reality. And some would say that Israel should cease building anything and should freeze all construction so that there could be some mechanism to bring the Palestinians to the table. I, I think that's just wrongheaded. Now, again, I understand how lonely I am on this point. I don't ask any of you to identify with it or agree with it, but I want you to understand that it would seem to me that that idea and philosophy has been a miserable failure. It has not succeeded. Here's a different idea. Instead of demanding that Israel not build anything, which has resulted in the Palestinians having no reason to go to the peace table, I think we should take every effort to accelerate the building and say, we will talk about ceasing when you decide that you will recognize the right of Israel as a sovereign state to exist and have safe and secure borders. And until then, there will be no cessation of construction. And one of the reasons one of the reasons that I find the UN such a place where no longer I really care to see my tax dollars support it is that it has become utterly impotent, not merely to act. It has become impotent so much as even to speak against the evil that is often allowed a forum within its walls. And I don't think that there is any amount of political Viagra that can cure the impotence of the United Nations. It's time for our contributions to it to cease unless it decides that it is going to be what it was intended to be from its beginning. When I take the groups that I take to Israel, there are some things we always do. One, I don't think a person can really understand Israel without going to Yad Vashem. I do not think it's possible to understand Israel if one doesn't go to Masada. Now, I realize that for a Christian, some people would say, why Yad Vashem and Masada? Those are not Christian sites, but they are. They are in the sense that my own faith requires me to recognize and respect that when freedom is taken from you, it will soon be taken from me. When it is trampled upon, on your behalf, it will only be a matter of time before the same hate and tyranny will trample upon it in my own life. And then there's another place that I take people that may seem a bit obscure. There's a cemetery just across from Mount Zion. And in that cemetery, there's the grave of Oscar Schindler. And one walks down the path, and it's, it's a pretty rugged little walk if you've been there. A lot of the time, some of the people who go with me are older, and we have to take their time. But I always say, I want you to go if it's at all possible for you physically to do it. And when we gather at the grave of Oscar Schindler, I remind them that 
the final scene in the movie, uh, Schindler's List, was filmed there. And those who are Schindler's survivors were photographed in that last scene of that great film, coming to place the stone there on top of the grave of Oscar Schindler. And it's in a moving and powerful moment in the movie. But I ask those who are with me, I say, look around. Is there any grave upon which you see as many stones as you see upon this grave of Oscar Schindler? And as one looks around, no grave comes close. One barely can read the name because of the stones that have been placed there in respect and in honor and in memory. And then I remind them, Oscar Schindler is revered as a great man because he saved the Jews who worked for him. And in the end, he was sad that he could not save more. But Oscar Schindler was a scoundrel of a man, an adulterer, a drinker, a carouser, not exactly citizen of the year, if you will. He's not the person who probably would have sat on the front pew of a Christian church or had been honored as the person of faith. But I tell you that his faith was more evident in what he did than by anything he ever said. A person who may do things that we find unacceptable, but who yet carries out the love of God by saving people has done a great work and a far greater work than the people who only speak of doing great things, but never so much as take the risk of one dollar of their income or one moment of their reputation to truly save the life of another. I believe God will bless those who bless his people who have been hunted and chased and through many attempts have come this close to being annihilated from the face of the earth. And I believe as a nation, it is incumbent upon us to one day make sure that no one says of us, why didn't you do something to save the lives of those who were more like you than anyone else on this earth. What happens in the building over behind us, we cannot, we cannot likely change. But we can walk out of this building determined that the truth will be said from our lips and the deeds from our lives will be consistent with all that is right and holy and just. And if that happens, then I'm convinced we shall overcome. Thank you very, very much. I go back to the words I said when we opened this conference. So why were we here? We were here to shine the light of day upon the perversion of human rights and freedoms by those we charged with defining and promoting them we were here to ensure that the dots between hate and violence are seared in our collective minds. And we were here because we refuse to stand by while the defenders of the Jewish people are demonized and targeted for destruction. Having heard the terrible anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism and anti-democracy and freedom, the words again from the Iranian president today handed a platform by the United Nations again today. I think that we can say collectively, we did the right thing in coming together. We did see the perversion of human rights, and we, these heroes of our age among us, said, no, not in our name. Now it's time to translate that resounding no into a political message for the United Nations and democracies around the world. Thank you for coming.